Hello, and welcome to show number 2333 of Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. So I've, you know, I've been snowboarding and skiing and ski biking and mountain biking and rock climbing and whitewater kayaking and whitewater rafting and hunting and all sorts of stuff with these organizations. And we'll be talking with today's guest about some of those extreme sports and how he does it. We'll talk with Zach Tidwell about, in particular, his skydiving experiences, both as a blind person and how it compared to his skydiving experience when he was fully sighted. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from Zach Tidwell. Whether you've been visually impaired or dealing with whatever other disability you may have, or even if, if you're not, if you don't have any disabilities, if you have a goal that you want to do and you're telling yourself that you can't do it for some reason, unless it's something that, you know, like if you're blind, obviously you're not going to get your driver's license. Stop telling yourself that you're, you're not able to do it and find out a way to do it despite whatever that barrier is. A great tip. And you are certainly an example of doing that. Support for Eyes on Success is provided by... Inclusive, an e-learning platform built for the blind community to learn technology, occupational, and career skills to help you reach your employment goals. More information is at www.clusive.io. That's www.clusiv.io. You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Let's start by meeting Zach and learning about his work developing the Xanagrams Wordplay app that we talked about last week on episode number 2332. Last week, we spoke with Zach Tidwell about his journey and how he came to develop and newly launch his Xanagrams Word Puzzle app in the iOS App Store. And during that interview, he spoke about some of his very interesting hobbies. So we thought we'd focus on that with him this week. But before we do that, Zach, maybe you can tell people a little bit about yourself and tell them a little bit about your Xanagrams app. Okay, I can do that. So... If you guys didn't listen to last week's episode, my name is Zach Tidwell, and I'm 27 years old. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I lost my sight four years ago to a suicide attempt. I shot myself in the head, and that left me totally blind and deaf in one ear. And after building up my blind guy skills, I decided to teach myself how to code so that I could create accessible apps for our community. And now my, my first one, which is called Xanagrams, is available on App Store. And it's accessible for people who are totally blind. It's accessible for people who are low vision and for people who can see. We can confirm that because I played it as a fully sighted person. Pete played it as a totally blind person. And we both enjoyed it. And I see it's gotten lots of traction on the Apple Viz website, I'm glad to see. Lots of people are interested in that new app. So congratulations. Yeah, it seems like people are starting to to find out about it, which is really cool. And especially like I I launched the app with without really any low vision accessibility features because I'd never heard anyone during the beta. And I've since added those and those seem to have been well received and it's been really neat. So if people want to learn more about that app and how you came to develop it and actually learn your blindness skills and learn to code in a very short period of time, they should listen to last week's episode. Support for Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Find out more about partnership opportunities by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is an assortment of unlikely sports that Zach Tidwell enjoys, in particular, skydiving. 
Well, Zach, as we mentioned in the introduction, we wanted to focus this week mostly on some of your interesting hobbies that sort of came up as a sideline in last week's episode. And what caught our attention as one of those hobbies was skydiving. Tell us a little bit about skydiving and how you got involved in that. So I wouldn't say I not necessarily involved in it. I had the chance to do it. So I did. I had actually, when I could see, I'd been skydiving at the time. It was for my 18th birthday. That's what I wanted. And my dad, who is terrified of heights, actually went with me and it was awesome. And now I'm 27. I was on a trip for disabled veterans and it was all sorts of different disabilities, but they figured out a way to throw us all out of a perfectly good airplane. So I was strapped to another grown man's chest, which is not the most fun airplane ride up because you're kind of like sitting in their lap. <laughs> but they they strap themselves to your back. And then when it's your chance to jump, you just kind of lean out the door and then it's sensory overload. So just to clarify, when you jump out, you're both basically face down and you as the less experienced person are on the bottom? Correct. So if we, if our parachute was to not come out, you know, I might be a little bit of a cushion for the, the instructor. <laughs> That's you now so he can keep teaching later that day. <laughs> an interesting way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like that's what Nancy was getting at, so I figured I'd just put it out there. Uh, I don't think you could provide a sufficient cushion <laughs> to do any good with a non-functioning parachute. You had done this several years earlier when you were fully sighted. How did the experience compare with between doing it sighted and doing it blind? Just sensory-wise, it was so overwhelming blind. And not in a bad way. It was it was neat. It was just... Have you guys both been on roller coasters before? I hate them, yes. Okay. So you know that when you're about to go over the crest on, on a roller coaster and you get that kind of gut-dropping feeling when you start to fall. Yes. You don't get that when you when you skydive. It's really odd. There's no sense of like deep bodily sense of falling it's just the wind it takes your breath away and so they actually tell you not to look down at the ground and to look at the horizon because if you look down at the ground the air is moving so fast past you that it's really hard to breathe and so if you look up it's kind of turbocharging it and shoving air into your nostrils <laughs> so you can breathe oh interesting when i could see it's it's weird knowing that you're not inside of anything and you can see the horizon and it just like really doesn't look like it's moving a whole lot while you're falling. Can you free fall for about 60 seconds? I think when I jumped, when I could see it was in Colorado and I live at elevation. So we jumped from about 18,000 feet and this time it was in Illinois and I jumped from about 14,000 feet. So a little different elevation wise, but relative to the actual like ground elevation where I was at, probably about the same. And uh, this time it was so loud, all that wind blowing past you. And it's kind of like a shock to your system. And then it registers like, holy crap, I'm <laughs> falling through the sky. And especially now, because I can't see, I have zero control over the situation. And it is uh, just like Nancy said, your instructor is literally strapped to your back. So you're just falling and it's, you know, they're there, but you don't register that while you're falling. And so when they pull the chute, it's kind of violent once the air kind of catches and it feels like you get jerked up. And then when you're floating there, honestly, I've, uh, this is how I've explained it to my family and friends that have asked is, is it feels fake. It feels like you're on a movie set or something and they have you rigged up to a harness and someone just blowing a fan in your face. It's really odd. <laughs> it's, it's cool. So the, the instructor will generally give you the toggles at some point and tell you to pull down really hard to turn and stuff like that. And when you turn with those skydiving parachutes, I mean, if you crank down really hard and try and turn, they almost rotate to a different axis and you, you kind of end up like parallel with the ground and spinning. 
it was so disorienting because I knew we were turning and things like that, but it didn't feel like it. I just felt like someone was blowing a fan in my face, but it was absolutely something I would do again. That must be interesting. As a sighted person, you're looking at the horizon and you can get some sense of your orientation, but being blind, you don't get those cues, I suppose. It must be kind of disorienting. Yeah, there's there's nothing. I mean, my instructor told me on the way out, he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll tap you when I'm getting ready to pull the chute. And he did. And then it's a couple seconds later, it just feels like you get cranked back up into the air. <laughs> it does. If it wasn't for the wind, you would have zero sense of direction. Because like I said, it does not feel like you're falling. So you mentioned that after a while of floating down with the parachute, the instructor handed you the controls. Had you had any instruction before jumping out of the plane, like even 10 minutes before getting in? No. So when you're when you're sitting in the hangar and it's kind of wild they they these planes are specially built for skydiving so they're they're smaller planes and then inside it's kind of just like bench seating that runs the length of the plane on either side and they just they do these you know, fast ascents and fast descents and so you hear the pilots kind of doing laps and they come down and the the plane had to cool off for 20 minutes before they could take it back up again and so in that period we're getting suited up and my instructor is explaining everything to me and how how it's going to go on the way up and when he's going to strap in um, to my harness and stuff like that but he just kind of told me to grab the, the toggles and then said you know hey bring bring the left side down down to your knee and pull down hard and me personally i felt the wind change but did not feel like my my position changed at all it was so strange that's interesting to me, one of the more scarier points of the ride would be when you come to hit the ground. You really don't have a good sense of when that's going to happen. So it wouldn't seem to me you get a good sense of how to brace yourself, how to roll when you hit the ground if you need to. What is it like landing? When I went skydiving, when I could see, we landed almost in, in like a little gravel pit. And I don't remember necessarily what they had us do, but I know this time... He basically had me just turn my body into an L. So I lifted my legs straight up out in front of me. And then he did the same underneath my legs. And we kind of just landed on our butts on some grass. And it was, I was super impressed. It was, it was just crazy smooth. It, there wasn't jarring whatsoever. Obviously that could turn into something that gets a little bit rough, but my instructor was awesome. And I think he had worked with the organization that, that we were out there with before. So I don't think that was his first time working with a blind guy. So you must approach the ground pretty slowly in order to make a relatively soft landing and not just all of a sudden jolt to the ground. Yeah, they're able to something with the those toggles. I think if they pull down on both of them at the same time, it does something with the risers on the parachute. So those the skydiving parachutes almost have like funnels that go through the canopy. It's not just a round parachute like you've seen or you may have seen with um like paratroopers and stuff like that it's it's totally different and when they pull down on those toggles i think it does something with those but it, it makes the parachute flare and it kind of makes you come to a standstill like it, it slows your forward progress and so as you're coming in they they do that and obviously on top of that with his just his skill it's like a, a good pilot when you're coming in at the airport. <laughs> it was just a smooth landing. Oh, interesting. I didn't realize they had those braking mechanisms. I suppose that makes sense and makes the ride a lot more pleasant and safer. Yeah. And a, it, you look a lot more coordinated than coming in and trying to run and <laughs> falling on your face, which is nice. Yeah. Those things do involve a fair amount of trust. Yeah. there There is a lot of trust in that, but obviously these are, when you go to a skydiving center, like these People are certified and they have hundreds or thousands of jumps. I mean, they have a resume where they can kind of fill you in a little bit. And you know that it's been verified by the employer, which helps. So I'm curious, you mentioned that when you jumped out of the plane, you were respectively at 14,000 or 18,000 feet. There's not a lot of oxygen up there. Do you need an oxygen supplemental tank or something when you're up there, or you pass through the high elevations quickly enough that you don't worry about that? 
No, you don't. You don't need it at that height. I, if you were hanging out up there, it might be be different. But there's something Halo and Hey Ho jumps are something that the military do, like the special forces guys will do, called high altitude low open or high altitude high open. And those guys need oxygen tanks to to do what they're doing. But they're jumping from like thirty thousand feet, crazy stuff like that. You don't want to pass out before you open the parachute. No, that would be a, a rough day for everybody. <laughs> right. Is it something you would try again? Absolutely. You mentioned your adaptive group for uh, military veterans. What other activities do you do with that group? This was the the first time that I've been out to that organization, but for the five days that we were out there, we did a triathlon the last day. We we went to the range and went shooting. Obviously, all of us are vets, so we we've had plenty of time behind rifles before. But and it was really cool. They adapted it so that it, instead of shooting paper targets like you typically would, we were using steel targets. So even those of us who were blind would it registered to us when we were hitting what we were aiming for, which was really neat. What and, a neat idea! Yeah. So we did that. I got to drive a turbocharged Polaris Razor, which is like a purpose-built off-roading vehicle, which was awesome. And I also got to do a flight lesson. So it was just me and a flight instructor. Each of us got to go up individually with an instructor. And I was in a little two-seater Cessna. And once we were up in the air, he let me do different turns and going up and down and, and stuff like that. It was really, really neat. Wow, what a fun program. That sounds like a great way of bonding with people, doing something enjoyable, and getting the adrenaline running again. Yeah, it was it was really neat, and it's called Oscar Mike, and it was created by a, a Marine Corps veteran as well, but he is paraplegic. And this whole thing was kind of Oscar Mike in the military means on the move, and so that's that's his premise behind that organization is just after a disability, like you shouldn't just be sitting around on your butt and doing nothing and get back after it. And that's really neat. And I assume there's programs like this for military veterans all over the country, not just in Colorado. Yeah. And so this organization was actually in Illinois, but like for me, I, I, I ski and like we talked about last week, I rock climb and whitewater kayak and stuff like that and there's organizations typically if you google adaptive sports center whether you're a veteran or not you'll you'll be able to find these organizations and it may not be in your state but a, a lot of these actual events that i go on those are typically veteran only but they're often at organizations that most of the year are just open for everybody with disabilities and their family members, which is really neat. So I've, you know, I've been snowboarding and skiing and ski biking and mountain biking and rock climbing and whitewater kayaking and whitewater rafting and hunting and all sorts of stuff with these organizations. And really, if if you want to get out and do that stuff, just start Googling whatever it is with adaptive attached to it. and You'll probably find something. So you just listed a whole lot of what I would consider extreme sports. Um, are these all activities that you used to do when you were sighted, or is this new stuff that you picked up after going blind? I was a big snowboarder when I could see. So while I was in the hospital after I shot myself, obviously I was doing the whole pity party thing and feeling sorry for myself and, but trying to, to learn basic blind guy skills. Like, you know, I had a, a Swiffer cane handle with a tennis ball attached to the end of it. And that was my blind guy cane at the hospital initially because they didn't know what to do or what to do to, to handle a blind guy. And then when I got transferred to the VA hospital, a, a blind rehab specialist came in and told me about adaptive sports. And that immediately became a goal for me to get back into because I've always been big into fitness. So I've always lifted weights and played sports. Um, I guess that snowboarding became a big thing for me in high school. After I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, and while I was in the Marine Corps, I was riding motocross, and I had a, a crotch rocket, and still working out and playing indoor soccer and downhill mountain biking and stuff like that. So 
it all initially started as trying to get back into things that I used to do, whatever I could do, or finding new things to fill those spots. And so like Brazilian jiu-jitsu became one of those things. Yeah, I wrestled in high school and we would spar in the Marines and that's not even an adaptive sport. There's no adaptive organizations for jujitsu. It's just something that is doable by feel. And so these were things I was just interested in. And so some of it was getting connected with other people who had done it and them introducing me to these organizations. And other than that, like with jujitsu, it was just me reaching out to gyms and telling them, hey, I'm completely blind, but I have grappling experience and I really want to do this. What kind of reaction have you gotten when you contact a gym and you give them that line? Are they usually receptive? Yeah. So, so far, I've only been a, a member of two different gyms. I've been training two and a half years now. The first one was while I lived in Denver and that was with no jujitsu experience. And that was like a year and a half after I'd lost my sight. And they seemed kind of unsure, but I met with the the gym manager and the head instructor at the time one day, like when they weren't doing class and came in and they kind of, I think they were definitely feeling me out a little bit to be like, okay, does this, do you, like, how's this going to work? And in terms of experience, like how does, how do you follow along with directions? And literally like the only thing that they change in classes is when the instructor is teaching a technique. I'm the dummy that they're showing it on. So while they're showing everyone else, I'm feeling what they're doing. And the class is at the same pace as any other, other class. And then you go with your partners and drill the moves and come back and do it over again with whatever they want to teach next. And I've also competed in two tournaments against people without disabilities. And I'm going to compete in my third here in about two months. And with those live matches, the only thing they change is that we start out touching instead of starting like two or three feet apart, you start standing and we, you both, like I get to put two hands on them and they get to put two hands on me. And that's how we start. You talked about your suicide attempt and subsequent blindness a few times. And what I think is really remarkable about your story is how quickly you got yourself back on your feet again, learned your blindness skills, learned to code, and all of a sudden you're involved in all these activities, which are very active. And I'm curious what you think the secret of your success is. Was it these activities or something else in your life that sort of got the ball rolling? Well, I was in the Marine Corps at all of the the chow halls, which are basically like the, the cafeterias that we eat our meals at when we're not out in the field and stuff. Every table had salt and pepper shakers on it. And on the salt and pepper shakers, it said, made proudly by the blind and visually impaired. And while I was in the hospital, after I had learned that I was going to be completely blind, I told my parents, I was like, I am not making salt and pepper shakers. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I told them, and I was like, I'm not being that person. Like, I'll be, like I was doing so much beforehand. I'm not, not going to, to stop my, my momentum. And I was snowboarding eight and a half months after I shot myself. Not very well. And to the point where I don't snowboard now. I ski and ski bike <laughs> instead because I was really bad at it blind. But, um, and that was before I knew how to cook for myself or anything like that. You know, I'd been to blind rehab, but I was still living with my parents. And that was really the first sense of independence that I got back was through those adaptive sports. And that helped me mentally, honestly. Obviously, when you wake up from a suicide attempt and you're blind, that's not an awesome spot uh, mentally to be in. And, those were like my short-term goals while I worked on the long-term goals of really like honing my skills and getting back out on my own. And I, I think really striving for independence in whatever way you can earlier, early on like that is so important because I've met people who, who have chosen to not be independent. And obviously some people have other disabilities associated with their vision loss that may not make that possible. But if you're capable of being independent, I think you have to strive for that and you have to want that for yourself. Well, you are certainly the poster child of getting over a bad situation, making the best of it, and and winding up with a very successful and motivating life and story. Great talking with you. Thank you, guys. You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Success.
Now for this week's final item, how to learn more about getting involved in adaptive sports and how to contact Zach Tidwell. Well, Zach, if people had questions for you, would they be able to contact you? Yes. So on Twitter, I'm at Zach C, as in Charlie Tidwell, and the Z, the C, and the T are capitalized. And then if you are curious about Xanagrams, you can look that up on the Apple App Store. It's the word anagrams with a Z in front of it. Or you can email me at contact at darkhorsegamestudios.com. And as you mentioned last week, there will most likely be more accessible games coming out of Dark Horse Studios. Yeah, I've started on the next one already. So <laughs> we'll we'll get there. So can you recommend any kind of umbrella adaptive sports organization or just Google the one you're interested in? The NSCD is the National Sports Center for the Disabled. and They have a headquarters up in Winter Park and Denver, I believe. I don't know where else they're at in the country, but that's adaptive sports for anyone with disabilities and also adaptive adventures. I don't think they're national yet. They are in a couple states throughout uh, the country right now. But even if if they don't have programs in your area, I would suggest reaching out to them and seeing what else is there. But those are the, the two big ones that seem to cross state lines that I know of. Great. In case you missed any of that information, check out the show notes associated with episode 2333 at www.eyesonsuccess.net. And remember, you can always use the search field on our website to look for other extreme sports or any sports at all. Just put in the word sports or extreme sports or whatever particular sport you're looking for, because we've probably done an interview about it. That's it for today's show. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking about going beyond the words in documents and presentations. Creating impactful documents and presentations is important for connecting with your sighted friends and colleagues in all walks of life. We'll talk with Judy Dixon about her recent two books called Designing Documents for Appearance and The Power of PowerPoint, each of which gives tips on how those who are visually impaired can produce such material. And those could be pretty important tools for almost anybody. So thanks for joining us this week and hope to catch you next week. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.